to our panel on um, international crime fiction. We've already introduced ourselves, and any additional information can be found in the uh, programs. Uh, what I will say is that I'm going to start by asking Jessica, as editor of Manila Noir, that in your introduction, you referred to the authors having a quote, a deep connection and abiding love for this crazy making city. And I just wondered what it is about Manila that really lends, it, lends itself towards depiction in sort of Moorish terms. And by that token, you know, what it was to edit the stories that were in this anthology and sort of see how each of the authors included provided a particular cross-section of Manila. Well, I think, first of all, Manila has a lot, it's a haunted place. It's a city that is, um, uh, a city of extremes with extreme poverty and extreme wealth. So right there you have the perfect sort of ingredients for um, a very healthy criminal uh, underworld. And mix that up with um, a heavy dose of um, a bloody history of colonialism and all sorts of different kinds of criminals coming through the history and the Catholic Church, which mixes everything up, plus uh, the um, spiritual life of the indigenous people. So it's, it's complete um, hybridity and uh, chaos and beauty. And, uh, and it's very hot. So there is this sort of torrid um, thing that bad tempers. You know. And by very hot, we're speaking tonight when it's been over 90 degrees for the past little while. How, how does that compare to? It's close, but it's always like that. Mm -hmm. So um, I just think that it's, it's, it's an amazing, um, Manila itself as an urban setting um, has so much uh, to give the world uh, that, that it just made sense to me to, to do the book. So moving to you, well, obviously you sent your books uh, in Manila, Vienna, and I just wonder, you know, if you can talk a little bit about what it is that the setting, how it, I guess, influences, but also is very much a part of, of your work too. Uh, uh, my books seem to be crime novels, but they are more funny than thrilling, and that's because I thought it's funny from the first moment of writing a crime novel, which is located in Austria, nobody would really believe there is <laughs> something like mafia or uh, a kind of violence you would believe in Manila or, <laughs> or in Mexico City or where, wherever. So uh, my first book uh, is located in a little village, not even in Vienna, but it's about skiing and freezing to death on a ski lift. So, so it's uh, it's more about more about the funny side of writing. Manila, that means. Yes, you have to project. I tried. I tried. So what I said was that uh, my readers read my book because they think they are funny, they want to laugh, and not because they want to bite their nails and have nightmares after reading my books. So they are. They are uh, where they seem to be who done it. There is a detective and there is a murder case and it's solved. This is the frame of the story. But really the really important thing or or what might make a few of my books interesting is the way how the story is told. So there is a, a narrator who talks a lot uh, about this detective. He is commenting on everything and but it's never, uh, you can never fi find out who is this narrator. Which is an interesting device too. Why did you, why did you use that device? Because it's the, the most old fashioned way of writing a novel. It's <laughs> like forbidden. When, when I started writing books as a young man, I knew this is the one thing I would never do. And you, you always try to find out new ways of storytelling and when the years went by, this became like a very interesting and fascinating taboo for me. 
like a godlike narrator is the last thing you are allowed to do. And so I thought, just why not? I always moved to use it because, to my mind, Midnight Promise was very rooted in the American PI tradition, sure. yet of course it's set in Australia. So I just wondered what sort of, I guess, tensions or interplay or what you were or what you were trying to do with John Dorn and, and in front of both tradition and also anti-tradition standpoint. Yeah, well, I mean, it, it obviously is private detective fiction is deeply rooted in American um, culture, really, and you, I mean, I've had a lot of trouble, it's the $60 million question, you know, because I've had so much trouble trying to figure out how to handle that, because you can just write a couple of sentences and suddenly you're sounding not only kind of cliche within the genre, but you sound like an American, um, which uh, isn't that bad, it's not that bad thing. <laughs> but if you, try, if you try to claim to be Australian, then it can be, it can be kind of jarring. I mean, at the end of the day, one of the wonderful things about private detective fiction is that it really does get to know a city. Um, setting up a whole book there, uh, as I've done here. Setting it in Melbourne, incidentally. Uh, I'm not going to assume that people in here know, necessarily know where Melbourne is. Melbourne is a city in Australia on sort of the southeastern tip of the mainland. Uh, it's probably the second biggest city uh, in the country, after Sydney, you all know Sydney. Um, <coughs> It's slightly, well, it's colder than Sydney. It's slightly more cosmopolitan. Um, it's perhaps a little bit more intellectual, although there's at least one person from Sydney here today that may disagree with that. Um, certainly, my book is no evidence to the fact that Melbourne is more intellectual, but um, it's, uh, I find it an endlessly fascinating place, and private detective fiction is a way to sort of explore a city in a really, um, I think, in a, in a really effective way. And when you're doing that, you can't help but have that city effect. Uh, the idioms you're using and the phrases and the language that you're using, so you can't help but make it, um, I found at least, I couldn't help but make it an Australian book um, in a very Melbourne book. And yet, what I find interesting, and I'd like all three of you to talk about this, and whoever wants to go, through, uh, go first, is that you're writing about Melbourne, but when, it, when it's essentially being exported to American readers, we just assume it's the country, even though, and so you're essentially standing in. So Simon Brenner, is this assumed to represent all of Austria, and so and all the reams of Scandinavian crime fiction are supposed to represent this monolith, when in fact they're very individual books and voices and, and the like. And you know, Manila Noir is supposed to represent you know not just Manila but the entire Philippines. And I sort of wonder who, like, who says that? I, I, I don't so argue that. against it. That's good. Sure. <laughs> I mean. I think each country is, is so complicated, uh, and I think readers now, uh, I, I kind of feel that readers are, are much more knowledgeable in a way. Like, I know we're no more in this. No, I'm just, I'm teasing, but, um, but not. Um, you know, Manila is the capital city, but you get out of Manila and it is a totally different thing. And you can go further south and, you know, I mentioned being predominantly Catholic, and it's it's a Muslim country, you know, and it's, it's lush jungle. And that's what's so fascinating. Uh, so I would never, um, I, I sort of try to take great pains, but it, but it is the capital city, so it gets a lot of play. Sure. But I think readers are smart now. A lot of them are. Well, how would you, I guess, respond to this? Since you also referred to one of your book, books being set in a smaller village versus the larger city. I think this is a question about realism in literature. And realism is always fake. <laughs> it can be better fake or well done or not so well done. And that's uh, what I am interested most in writing. So how you start to, you, you pretend you are telling a story about real people who really live in a real city that really exists, but it's always something you make up. And it depends so much on what style you're choosing. So like, I can say here what I want, it, it depends very much 
whether my microphone works or not, whether you can hear me or can hear me not. So what I say is not as important as the question whether the microphone works. And it's the same when you write a novel. It, uh, you can write it about Berlin or about Paris or about New York, but it's much more important which style you're uh, using and what kind of writing you do. Um, yeah, I, I think that's totally true. You know, I, I, I know at least one writing teacher I've had who insists that voice is all that matters, and, and the method by which you tell the story is, the, is what keeps people reading after that, be it place or plot or, or, or anything else or characters, um, takes a second take second place. Um, but I mean, I'm personally very interested in, in, in stories that are set in um, stories that take their setting very seriously. Now, what does that mean? I don't know. To look at it from the other point of view, I'm convinced that anyone who were to read my book wouldn't have to take time to come to understand Melbourne before they could follow the stories that were taking place. I'm not convinced that John Dorn, who is the private investigator of my book, um, is, a necessarily, is necessarily a person who is a product of his culture. Um, I think he's much more a product of the genre that I'm writing in uh, and what I was attempting to do with that genre. Um, but I am interested in places, and I'm also very interested in cities. In fact, I'm surprised to hear that Wolf has a private detective story that's set in, in, in a small town or in a village, because to me it's always been a genre that belongs in a city. Um, and, and the bigger and uglier and darker it is, the better. Um, but of course, the flip side to that is when you write about a city like Melbourne, it, there isn't really a dark side to it. No one really, no one really knows it. That's why I presume to sort of tell you where it is because it's not a city that I think people bring any baggage to when you discuss it. It's not like New York City, or London, or Shanghai, or perhaps even Manila. It's sort of a blank page, and so there is no dark side that people can sort of be intrigued by, and it doesn't feel like a place that's particularly fertile. But then, of course, that's a good thing as well because then it's a blank page for you to do whatever you want. And if you want to create a dark side, then it's yours to, to paint that picture. I mean, I was about to say that sometimes knowing when a city has a dark side can be a disadvantage mm. because you bring in all preconceived notions about what that dark side is. Was Did any of that come into play when we no, I tried to go against it, actually, because um, I, I like the surprise of, well, for example, California and the Philip Marlowe stories, you know, sunny California, right, where everybody's sure. But behind all that, there's always some rotten decay, you know. <laughs> and so maybe in Manila, it's a little on the surface. But um, you also, you still want to keep, um, I think, flipping people's expectations every time. So that's kind of what I've tried to look for in the stories. How are the writers approaching even that cliche? Which is a cliche. Well, I was about to say, in editing an anthology, I presume that you received more su uh, submissions than stories that you published, and I wondered, you know, what, what sort of elements of surprise did you encounter along the way, be it writers who submitted work that went against their own brain, or, you know, choosing particular milieus or topics that you weren't necessarily expecting. So I wondered what, what expectations of yours were challenged along the way. Well, the one piece that I absolutely loved and embraced, and um, I'm glad I did, was the graphic noir that's the centerpiece of the anthology. I had asked one of the writers, who, who actually is, has a series in the Philippines that features a priest who's a forensic <coughs> anthropologist. I mean, she has this you know, regular recurring character. And she had submitted a story to me, and I said to her, who do you know? who I don't know, young, you know, kind of not the usual suspects, and uh, doing something really different, but with, you know, crime as a motif. And she told me about these two guys, one writes it and the other is the visual person, and they have a series featuring a female detective. But she not only deals with the underworld, she also deals with the supernatural. And uh, 
and it's modern day Manila and all that. And I, 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 I was just blown away because I thought it was quintessentially Filipino, very sophisticated, but also very of the masses. And the drawings are beautiful, and it's a different way of telling a story, a noir story. And speaking of stories, we're going to get back to you saying, with Midnight Promise, they what were the stories? Uh, the book is essentially uh, linked stories featuring John Dorn, and I wonder, were you writing, did you write it all at once? Were you writing in piecemeal? How did the, how did the structure of it come about? Uh, they started off as exercises, actually, when I decided that I was going to write a crime fiction book that was about 10 years ago together. Um, and upon deciding that I was going to write a crime fiction book, I was, of course, challenged by the fact that I had no idea how to do that. So I thought I'd go about uh, practicing. So I started writing very, very short stories. Um, the goal was to keep them to a page and to basically develop the voice and to develop the character of John Dorn. John Dorn narrates all the stories in the book. Um, and this was intended to be a means of developing the voice to the point where I could uh, make it, make a, write a novel length story. Um, but what happened was I really started to enjoy writing the, writing the, the, the short stories. Um, and there was a moment there where I really had, where, when I realised for the first time I was liking what I was writing. Um, I'm sure there are some writers in the audience here who are uh, uh, familiar with the process. In fact, any artist would be familiar with the process of being committed to a particular medium, but just despising everything that you produce. Um, especially when you uh, dare to compare it with uh, the products that you uh, really appreciate. So um, finding stories that I really actually liked and finding myself rushing to get back to the desk to keep writing was just a revelation. Mm -hmm. uh, meanwhile, the novel-length story developed and it's still interesting to me that it's fallen by the wayside. And I realised after writing about seven or eight of these stories that this was the book and I could see where John was heading. Uh, John is on a very specific trajectory, I think, throughout the book. Uh, Then I put together, I suppose, three or four more stories, and yeah, there it was. And there it was. And I'm going to move back to you, Wolf, because you talk about the, the sort of godlike narrator. And so I wonder, what, are there ever, is there any tension where Simon wants to narrate his own story, or is he kind of held in check? Uh, I don't really, I don't really know why I started to write this way. I found out that written language is always much more boring than how people are talking. When people are talking, they are lively, and it, uh, when they write it down, they start to be like... I, I saw on YouTube a concert of Stevie Wonder mm -hmm. in front of the White House, uh, Barack Obama and so on and there. Uh, <laughs> Everybody, even the musicians and Stevie Wonder, they are very stiff. They don't move. Like, normally, they are moving on stage and they are alive. And there they were like they would have swallowed a load of volume or something. <laughs> so, and that's what uh, writing does to the language. So somehow, somehow people don't dare to write in, in the same lively way as they talk. So I, th I just started to, to write in the way I, I would tell the story to somebody when I'm, maybe, maybe when I'm drunk after midnight, <laughs> repeating the same thing again and again, or leaving away words from my sentences. And so, so that's why I started. Uh, writing in such a weird way. And when uh, the first book came out in uh, one of the big publishing houses in Germany, published my first novel, and then they got phone calls from the other publishers whether they are gone crazy, because this guy doesn't even know how uh, the, gra the German grandma. <laughs> <laughs> so it took a few years until they the reviewers and so on believed me that I did it deliberately. <laughs> <laughs> and somehow then the fun was gone. <laughs> so just to switch subjects a little bit, I want to talk about international fiction in terms of 
how all of you were translated. So for example, Jessica, how many countries publish your work now? Not that many. Not as many as them, probably. Um, it's interesting, for example, the Philippines, um, you know, a, a lot of people read in English, speak English, so there was no need to translate for my country of origin. Um, and uh, Spain and Mexico and Nor Norway was one of the most interesting countries that I found to be interested in my work. And I wish I could read Norwegian to see how they translated it. Because you know, that's a real um, curiosity to me. Have you had any feedback from readers in those countries to yeah. say, like, whether they notice differences between you know, the original work in English versus? No, only in the Spanish-speaking countries that, that, you know. But no, I don't know anyone. I wish I did. I mean, really, uh, how does it translate? The humor and, and all that. And then what's your experience? Like, have you read the, the English translated? I did, and I, I know that it's a good translation. There are a few people who told me it's, and I thought it's a good translation. But I think it's the first good translation I could into English. So I, I heard different stories about translations into other languages. And it's not only the translation of the language, it's especially difficult. For example, one of my books is translated into Japanese. I was about to bring that up to you. Is how, it, how is it when it's translated into other languages? Yeah. And, and other cultures. Yeah. So there are many jokes like about certain kinds of food in Austria. <laughs> And this wood doesn't even exist in Japan. So how how could they ever know that this is my funny or anything? And then uh, once I was like like today here in New York, I was invited to Tokyo, uh, and I had readings at the university and so on. And then the, the Austrian university lecturers who had invited me warned me beforehand. They said after the reading there will be a discussion. But uh, Japanese hate it to dis to stand up and uh, discuss. They only do it because they uh, want to be polite, and they know that in Germany we discuss after reading. So they they want they don't want to offend me. That's why they will <laughs> ask questions. So I sat there and, and knew now they are going to <laughs> ask me something because they don't want to offend me. And uh, my Austrian um, friends had also told me that something like uh, whodunits and crime writing doesn't really exist in Japan as a genre. They, they just have different books, but they don't make this definition of genre. And so the, there's many things are very difficult. And then the first guy who stood up was the professor. He left. He wanted to protect his students, so they didn't ha have to ask me. And he stood up and he said uh, to me, uh, in, in a not very good German, <laughs> that uh, Mr. Haas, you are a very famous crime writer. I know another one, Agatha Christie. Then <laughs> 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 I thought, well, <laughs> now it's difficult for me to answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wanted to be polite to him, so I could have said, yes, you are right. What's been your experience with translation so far? Oh, well, well, I haven't been translated yet, oh, except in, into American. Which, <laughs> that's, 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 that's a different thing. And there was, I mean, we had quite a few discussions about that. Um, there, there was nothing major, like I say, I think the stories translate very easily into American culture or European culture, or, or dare I say, they're universal. Um, but there were some elements of the language that needed to be tweaked, um, especially abuse. I think there's something about obscenities and things that you can call somebody in the heat of the moment that uh, I was told that Americans would just wouldn't necessarily understand. Uh, so I had to convert a few of those. Uh, but very little, really, and maybe that's a testament to just how influenced I am by American media and um, uh, by the, the Americanness, the innate Americanness of the genre. Um, very little, I mean, 
reference to a barrister who's changed, sure, in fact, I'm not sure if it even was changed, but I mean, we discussed a glossary for a little while um, because there are some elements which are just, which potentially make the story difficult to follow. Um, but we didn't put it in the end, and I think, I mean, I've got no reason to think that audiences, especially when they know the book's set in Melbourne in Australia, need to understand every single word. I'm going to just bring this back to Jessica. Do you feel, too, that the crime genre is particularly suited to commenting on, on society, be it you know international or national or whatever? And I just wondered what your further thoughts were on that. Well, I've been doing panels earlier um, this Crime Fiction Month. Um, and one of the things that was brought up uh, by a writer from Italy and a writer from Poland um, which was wonderful, we all talked about how often crime fiction, and you know, I get why there are genres, but I also think sometimes they, they really get in the way. Um, crime fiction is often thought of as some kind of second class uh, uh, type of literature, and uh, I'm a big fan of it. The good, the really, I mean, I feel like when the writing is great, the writing is great, and the characters are completely memorable and the language, you know, sings and all that and, and it can be quite, quite deeply moving. Who, who have you read recently, I guess in the genre, and I'll use quotes just be, since we're talking that way, but that really you feel fit, you know, fit and exceeded that your uh, uh, Roberto Bolaño. Sure. I think he's a prime writer. Well, that third section in 2666 sure is. <laughs> Yeah, and so is um, By Night in Chile, and so is Distant Star. But I was thinking of this Argentinian writer that someone turned me on to, you know, earlier this year, and, and <coughs> he's considered, you know, a crime fiction writer. He's not Argentinian, he's actually Spanish, but he had to live in Argentina because he was <coughs> exiled. And he wrote this book called The Buenos Aires Affair. Does anybody know this book? It is, it transcends. I mean, it, it's, it's, Dance. It's 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 poetic. It's, it's very political. It's very. It's just beautifully drawn and and exciting too. I mean, you can read it as you know this sort of thrilling piece of work. Um, what's that his, what's his name? Manuel Vasquez Montalban. Published by Melville. Excuse me. I think it's been dead. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I'm thinking of my little queen. What am I talking about? But yes, that's the that's the correct yeah. one. Yeah. And then I looked at his other work, and you know, it wasn't as grand as this. You could fe really feel that this was the book he poured his whole life into, and what a life he had. So I highly recommend it. I mean, in terms of, I mean, I love Elmore Leonard and all, and I think he sneaks that stuff in there. It's very sly and witty, and you know, it seems like it's just entertainment. But you know, there's a lot about the human condition that he really gets. Um, but this guy was new to me, and uh, I, I, I just thought he was beyond 